So, Dr. Bruce, you're going to be leaving Lighthouse Guild after, say, next week. Uh, and most people always assume that you've been here forever, but you weren't here forever. You were at SUNY for 25 years? I was at SUNY for 25 years. And it's um, an interesting story how I became very involved with the Lighthouse. I was going to professional school in Pennsylvania, and they had a residency in New York City. And I took the residency up, and it was at a place called the Optometric Center. Well, the Optometric Center turned out to be the clinic from Columbia University. Colum Columbia University had an ophthalmology optometry school, and they closed the optometry school, and some of the people who worked there took that particular clinic and called the Optometric Center. I, I took the program um, in 1968, and when I graduated, they offered me a job to work at the Lighthouse for a few hours. <laughs> but a couple years later, um, the flu hit, and it was a bad flu. And they kept saying, could you take certain so-and-so's position? I said, fine, I'll, I'll see him. And within a year, I was full-time at, at SUNY. And it was 1973, and there were a lot of Cubans that were leaving who were professionals. And they had ophthalmology, optometrists, and opticians who were coming in. And at that point, said, SUNY said to me, now this is going back to when I'm a, really a novice, and they're saying, we'd like you to come up with a curriculum. This is somebody who never put together a curriculum for the ophthalmologists, optometrists, and uh, opticians, and we're gonna do this all together. At that point, I was thinking very differently in my head what I have to do, and I worked very hard, and I was using the information that I had from a course that I had taken called subnormal vision in professional school, and I also took that when I had my residency program. And I decided I only know one way to do low vision, which was from um, Dr. Feinblum, who originated low vision in 1930 in New York City. And I said to my um, department chair, I said, there's something going on at Lincoln Center, and there's a Dr. Fay who is running the Lighthouse programs and she put together a film. And I said, I'd like to go there and see the film. And the film was a very fascinating film because Dr. Faye did something, now this is 1973, she took five pathologies and she decides that we're going to show real people with these pathologies, but we're going to have the audience see what these people see. We're going to make simulations of these people. So the first one is macular degeneration, and this woman wants to see her grandchildren. They're blurry in front of her. The second one is glaucoma, and we have lost some side vision and other problems. The third one is diabetic retinopathy. The fourth one is cataracts, which you may a little know a little about. <laughs> And the fifth one is retinitis pigmentosa, which in those days would have been a very unusual pathology to discuss. And it's somebody who's leaning over a car engine and he has a little lug nut, and if he loses that lug nut, it disappears into the engine. So this is the first time simulations are done by anybody. And those simulations actually to this day are used by the National Eye Institute. So if you go on their website, you'll find the simulations. If you go on the Jewish Guild for the Blind, we have simulations that have been made up for our organization. So, continuing on, I decided to talk to Dr. Fay, but it was very busy, it was a big deal, and it was held in Lincoln Center, a block away from here, which I think is very, very interesting, and I didn't have enough time to talk to Dr. Fay. But my sister-in-law was moving, moved to California to be working at, um, at Stanford University, and I decided the next year the Academy of Optometry was being held in San Francisco, and there was an ophthalmologist speaking there, Dr. Eleanor Fay, and I decided to go to that particular meeting and introduce myself again. And somehow we got together with one of my department chairmen who was very good at optics, and he and Dr. Fay put on uh, a three-day program 
where she would talk about ocular pathology and he would talk about the optics. And just after that, a couple of months later, I brought my first group of interns from SUNY, which was interesting because it's the first time that ophthalmology and optometry worked on that type of level. And Dr. Faber was very nice and said, uh, if any of you can't work with optometry, you can leave. <laughs> and didn't work out that way. They stayed. We had a wonderful group of ophthalmologists all the way to neuro-ophthalmology and pathology. And, and the group worked together. And it was a very unique situation in that uh, Dr. Faye said, well, let's do it with ophthalmology residents. And we're going to build a big glass window and on that window, it's gonna be a mirror on your side, but everybody's sitting on my side, which will be about 25, 30, or 40 ophthalmologists, and that's the first groups that came in, would be observing you doing a low vision evaluation. Well, at the end of the first, uh, let's say 45 minutes, that I was seeing a new patient that I had never seen before, doing the history, there was a knock on the door, and somebody said, Dr. Faye wants to see you, and I knew I had done such a great job. And she looked at me and said, don't you ever do that again. You were with a patient. You pay attention to the patient instead of looking down on your paper. So that was our first formal get together, Dr. Faye and I. Um, but we began to do that for a long time. But meanwhile, I wanna backtrack a little because the original group that started Low Vision came out of Manhattan Ioneer. There were three ophthalmologists in 1953 who decided that despite the fact that the lighthouse started in 1905, and let's say the Jewish Guild started a little, just a little while later, everybody was being treated as blind until 1953. And they said, well, three very distinguished ophthalmologists, Conrad Burns, um, uh, General Joe Fonda, and the third one just slipped my mind for a second. But they decided to uh, Dr. Kestenbaum, very renowned person as well, ophthalmologist, they decided they're going to form uh, a place called the, the Lighthouse. And coincidentally, a year or two later, Eleanor Fay shows up at Manhattan Eye and Ear. She is the first woman resident. And she said, can I observe? And in the 1960s, Dr. Fay becomes the first woman, I would say, to have a position like that in the country especially as an ophthalmologist. And when we get together, she is still putting together what you need to evaluate somebody with low vision. Now we have all these charts that go all the way back to 1865 for the Civil War, for example. We have the Snellen chart. Dr. Snellen is working with the Snellen chart. And when we get into the 1960s and 70s, we have the Snellen chart that's still being used. So a lot of interesting things happen. I went off to um, take a course at the National Eye Institute on research, and they were doing something on diabetic retinopathy. And they came up with a big chart, a very big chart, this big. And it was actually a modification of a, another chart that somebody out in Berkeley had designed, but they were gonna do this chart to measure people who had laser treatment with diabetic retinopathy. What happened to those patients? And so at the end of that particular study, I mentioned to Dr. Fay, I said, you know, they're discontinuing the use of that particular chart called the ETDR chart, early treatment of diabetic retinopathy. And Dr. Fay goes down to Washington, D.C., and she meets with the person who was head of research at that time, Rick Ferris, and she said, is there any way we could have that chart? He said, you can take that chart. So all of a sudden, anybody in the country who's watching this, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of that particular chart is ETDRS, and it's the Lighthouse International. It was Lighthouse then. And that becomes the chart that becomes our chart. So I am asked to be the first person to begin to evaluate patients using that chart. Now, with that, up to that point, uh, Dr. Fay had actually gone down to Will Warmer Eye Institute, and there was a PhD, Dr. Sloan, Louise Sloan, she had been working on a lot of different eye charts. And Dr. Fay had taken a lot of Louise Sloan's eye charts, but now all of a sudden she has a start 
a, a chart that's um, incredibly statistically significant. So you know if a patient is coming in that it's not just EFPT or we see LPET, each line has five letters on that chart. And I just happen, okay. each chart has five letters on the chart. And they're all statistically made so that they're equivalent on each of the charts. It has a lot of interesting features uh, and it's used to this day in research, but it's used throughout low vision. And then we came out with some charts that Dr. Fay had made. And what I have here is a small I have a small chart that's the equivalent of what we had the ETR chart. And so as you can see, this is for near for reading. Each line has five letters. And there are only 10 letters that were picked to that particular chart. And again, you'll notice that lighthouse is here at the bottom. And the one that we developed for close work had more than one chart. And so, so does the ETDR's chart. The ETDR, DR, ETDR's chart had one for the right eye, the left eye, and both eyes. And so we began to develop other charts. I was involved in some of these, which are continuous text charts. So it's great if you could read letters, but how is your vision? If you have macular degeneration, can you read lines? And so this goes from very large lines all the way to very small lines. And so where is reading? Reading is down in this particular area. Uh, this is a high contrast chart. So you might be doing very well since the letters are black set up on a white background. And then we even involve charts, develop charts for younger people. And the clinician would have a chart that was set up with letters. And we, this is actually the, the second modification of it. Um, and we had to look out about what the word was. In all honesty, you had to be very careful in picking out your words. and. Uh, so this, this is used to this day, and then we made a number chart, and then we made charts in, in Spanish as well. And so that was one of the big areas that we got involved in. But one day, one of the researchers came to me and said, I think you're gonna like somebody who's visiting us today. His name was Arthur Ginsberg, and Dr. Dr. Ginsberg was a PhD who was head of the Air Force Vision Laboratory. And he and he's, was showing me a chart. Now it's not this chart, but this is one that one of our heads of research developed, Eris Arditi. This particular chart has letters that are 100% contrast. Now, I have it in here, so let's take this out. This is 100% contrast, and it gets about 4% lighter as you go across the chart. So a normal person with normal vision, I don't expect them to read here, I expect them to read this particular line. When you develop an eye pathology, including an area that you were very involved in, cataracts, patients start to get poor and poor responses to this particular chart. And at one point you know that that cataract has to come out if they're doing very poorly because they're having poor contrast. And poor contrast will result in not seeing the edge of the, the curb when you're walking down the street. You're sitting at a restaurant and saying, I can't read what's in, on the menu. So this chart becomes the chart that I, I ended up using. I was using up another interesting chart that Dr. Ginsberg had done. And uh, it turned out that the contrast chart that we were using, I never knew this until years later, was top secret because the contrast chart was developed for the astronauts. The astronauts were tested for visual acuity, but they were also checked what happens when you're out in space. Is the contrast sensitivity affected? And so, uh, again, I was asked to work with Dr. Ginsberg's charts originally, 
and I know we were one of the first places in the United States to take into account the importance of contrast, which is very important in the pulp pathologies, a few of the pathologies that I mentioned earlier. Macular degeneration, it's a big problem. Glaucoma, it's a big problem. And cataracts, it's a big problem. Interestingly enough, if your central vision is still there in retinitis pigmentosa, it may not be a big problem. So what I also found out that, interestingly enough, people who have an age-related eye condition, meaning they're getting it after the age of, say, 55, will do poorly on this particular chart if they have a pathology. Interestingly enough, people who have earlier onset, and what I mean by earlier onset is an eye disease that might be um, diagnosed when they're in their 20s or, or even their teens, they do rather well on this. So a lot of times I can differentiate that. Somebody said, oh, I got this late in life. And then I noticed that they're able to read down here. Well, people with macular degeneration don't read these lines very easily. And I realized this is something that's an early onset eye condition. Uh, one of them is a condition called Stargardt's macular degeneration, which is very common with patients that we see here. So. This has been incredibly beneficial. More, more importantly, it's been beneficial to somebody sitting in the room with them and say, well, why is mom having problems? Well, mom's having a problem because they can't see something like this. So how does that translate into what we're doing today? Well, I have to bring up our new technology center that you put in place a couple of years ago tells us that patients really aren't going to be helped optically with a lot of situations. They have to get into technology. Why? Because optical systems don't enhance the contrast. Technology does. Devices that we have um, can put, as, as we all know, the, the people who work here, black on white or white on black, or even other colors they can use for the contrast. So I think years later, we finally found out why, why this is so significant, why it's working with them. One of the other areas that we were getting involved in, and uh, I was very fortunate that Corning approached myself and Dr. Fay, and at that point, Dr. Fay was saying, why, why don't you see these people? They, during World War II, there was a, a lens that was used for pilots to dark adapt them during runs. And one of the lenses was a red lens. And they have numbers, CPF 550. It's a red lens on the visual spectrum. And Corning said, we'd like to test that with certain patients. Well, when the pilots would take off their lenses, they were dark adapted. And they said it might work with certain eye pathologies. So the per first pathology that we thought of was retinitis pigmentosa, because those are patients that have a hard time at night. And we found out that d even during the daytime, when they're looking out the window, things are enhanced. But more importantly, when they would take off the dark lens and they'd walk inside normally without a dark lens like the, the 550, they would have to stand in the hallway maybe for 10 minutes before their eyes adapted. So we found out with, and it turns out genetically, not every single patient adapted the way they should. We found out later on that genetics plays a big role. Why didn't that patient versus this one do as well? But we found out that the 550 worked very well on certain patients, very well accepted. And they decided to do, do it for the other eye pathologies. What is macular degeneration? What is glaucoma? How would, are they going to respond? So we ended up doing a clinical study and I put together a team across the United States of, of colleagues. And by the way, it was optometry and ophthalmology. I found that the two groups work very well together. And so we came up with three different colors. Now, it didn't start out as three different colors, uh, but I want to point out something interesting about this lens. This lens, these lenses are glass. Well, glass was going out of favor because plastic was getting much better. And this lens was different from the original Corning lens. Corning had put out a lens 
which was a gray lens in which they embedded crystals and that lens would get darker when you went outdoors. Why don't we adapt something like this and these lenses and when you go outdoors, things will get darker indoors at a lighten up. So we came out with three different types of lenses and one would have been for people with, red, with macular degeneration who benefited, benefited from, and they have numbers again, 527 would be in the orangey color range. And again, somebody will come inside, they would feel much better, but outdoors things would be brought in high contrast and they would see same things they couldn't see before. Another one was for diabetics. They seem to do better in a lower range where it was in the orange-yellow range. And so this became a lens that we found was very beneficial. And by the way, when we started the research, we didn't have these numbers. We had groups of numbers. And then we'd have a column and say, you know, 15 people did well and only one did well on, on that one. So we started to break it down. What works out the best? And the third one is something that people have known for over 100 years, duck hunters. They would go into a duck blind in the morning, and it was foggy, they couldn't see something. They would wear yellow lenses. Yellow lenses work the best with a condition such as glaucoma. So this was made up by Corning. They make it to this day. We don't put it on every patient. They can be incorporated into a regular pair of glasses, and these are clip-ons. At Lighthouse Skill, what we love is when technology that was developed for people who are visually impaired. It turns out to help people that actually aren't visually impaired. And so that sometimes so sometimes some of these lenses can help can help people who don't have eye disease. For example, sometimes fishermen will there's certain help them see the fish or athletes or the sort of thing. I know you you were you were involved with the um, Nike uh, contact lenses um, that would help that were designed for various sports. I think you hit a good part because fishermen use Polaroid type of lenses a lot of times. So I did, one of the things growing up was going fishing. <laughs> and you wear a Polaroid lens because you can see through the water. And, you, and you're right, all of a sudden, this became an, a big ap athletic thing where they said, well, you're exactly correct. It's not just for that. And, and so there was a whole spectrum of lenses that was, was developed for athletes which is something I didn't really think about too much. <laughs> so the other thing was, there was another company, now these things are fairly expensive, and it, it was somebody else that uh, we started to do work with out in, um, he was in um, Michigan, and he would make these type of lenses, wraparound lenses, and, but he could make different transmissions. So, this, is, this has a transition 450, which is what the yellow lens is. But the, if you look at the visible spectrum, you could make hundreds and hundreds of different colors. People don't realize that. And yesterday I took a lens, but I just wanted to say that all of these lenses were made from the Lighthouse. This came out of the Lighthouse, Lighthouse International Jewish Guild for the Blind over the years, where our patients began to use all of these different colors. They, so. These were actually developed at the lighthouse, the different transmissions for different conditions. And one of them is almost exactly what you just talked about, a gray lens. You can have a gray lens that was used in photography, but you could have a light filter, a darker and a darker filter. So you could change transmissions when somebody's inside as well as when somebody's outside. And I just used the word transitions and transitions get darker as well. So these became very, very popular. And Dr. Faye said one day, why don't we do something, I don't know where she came up with this idea, but a plum lens. And yesterday I took out a plum lens. It looks like plum, that's, that's what the color is. And the patient has something called cone dystrophy. Well, it's unusual, but he said, I'm one of three people in the United States who have this condition. He's seeing Dr. Stephen Sang at the Columbia University, who is probably the premier person on the earth, who knows all about this, and I'm thinking, I'm gonna try something. I took the plum color, 
I went back to the chart that we were looking at and this person got stuck after three lines and I put the plump color on him and I said, does it look any different? He said, yes, N S Z K H D. I could not improve his vision with any optical system. I walked him over to the window. I said, what do you see? He said, I see the trees for the first time. So this is something new that I found yesterday and never, never even thought about it. It, it. it just points to the fact that we're always learning. <laughs> You've been at this a long time and you learned something new yesterday. I did, I did. And I, I said to our head of research, Bill Seipel, I said, this is incredible. You know, I'd like to see more, more of these kind of patients. So one of the other areas that I'd like to mention, because this is something early on that one of our people designed originally at the lighthouse, and I'm not sure if it was Dr. Kestenbaum, but when people get stronger and stronger lenses, if you hold something closer, your eyes converge, which means they turn in, and the closer you get, the more convergence, and it's hard to hold something over here for long periods of time. And one of the doctors came up with this idea, well, if we incorporate prism, you'll be able to hold something much closer, 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 closer. These actually became the lighthouse lenses, and they go from one weaker power all the way up to very strong lenses. This, be this became part of all low vision clinicians, regardless of what they are, ophthalmology, optometry, as part of their set of lenses to use. Because these glasses will both magnify and help the person hold things close. They can magnify, hold them close, and I can incorporate another part of the uh, prescription astigmatism. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of benefits. And again, we were the first ones to come out with this. And, and that worked out very well. One of the uh, areas, and I will have to bring forward a couple of things, Dr. Fay and, and our head nurse said, we'd like you to give a lecture. Now, I've been out there all of a year, <laughs> and I'm gonna be giving a lecture. And I said, well, how many people? They said 50. So, you know, after giving zero lectures, no, I actually gave it to the, I was getting better because I did the Cuban program also. So we're getting better. And uh, my first slide was with Galileo. And I was going to do telescopes. I said do telescopic lenses. So I did okay in that lecture, but I have to tell you what happened when they said, you did very well, and we'd like you to come out with us at a meeting that's being held out in Portland, Oregon. And I said, how many are going to be there? It said, it's the Association for the uh, Health of the Blind. It had a different name that's not used anymore. There'll be about a thousand people. <laughs> and so I didn't think I would make it through that one, but I did also. But I, I became very interested in telescopes, and I began to uh, come up with my own ideas. Now, Dr. Feinblum had developed the first telescope, by the way, that came through ophthalmology from about 1925, where an ophthalmologist had come up with a telescope that would you, you would use for reading. Telescopes for reading are very difficult to use. Uh, surgeons do very well with telescopes because they're looking at a confined area. Um, Dr. Feinblum's idea was to come up with a telescope that you could use for far away. And I started to work on telescopes, and the one thing I found out about the telescopic lenses, which, for example, this lens says three times, this will make things appear to be three times closer. So if I'm going to the theater, if I'm going to the, let's say, something held at Lincoln Center, you're not going to see this, the whole stage, but you'll see it a lot clearer. And that's 20 feet away, and telescopes were set for 20 feet and beyond. But what about if you did want to use it for something like reading sheet music? Uh, Galilean telescopes were not made that were focusable. I shouldn't say that. There was somebody in New York who made the Galilean telescope that was focusable, but would never share it with any other clinician. I said, can we have this made so what this means, this is a focusable telescope that will focus down to a very small distance. And again, if you want to read sheet music, it's going to help you for something like that. And I came up with a system that you can fit all different types of telescopic systems here. 
and it would make it easier for the clinician as well as somebody who was getting that type of telescope to use something like that. And uh, eventually uh, I was involved in a meeting, I was still in the novice stage, but people from all over the country came up in 1976 to New York City and this was a meeting on can you drive safely with telescopes? And um, there was an ophthalmologist, Arthur Keeney, who came in from K Kentucky, and he was one of the opponents. Dr. Fonda, who was the ophthalmologist at the lighthouse, he was one of the opponents. And they came up with a New York State law. And the New York State law was the template for the rest of the world on driving with special types of lenses. What goes into that? And to this day, I've only heard of one death over the last, well, we're going back to 1976, that happened in Boston. And it wasn't the fault of wearing the lenses at that point. And so there are strict laws that New York has, but if you're visually impaired, there are three licenses in New York State. And a lot of people are not aware of that. And uh, I think we have to be very careful when, if we do prescribe something like this for somebody. And they have to be checked out every single year by the New York State Commission for the Blind. And so I enjoyed making some other types of things. And, and over the years, I've come up with something that said, said, can I see far away when I'm at a lecture? And can I read something down here that I, that I can use now? Well, we have a lot of other new types of devices that can be used, as we know, and we have to go back to technology. You don't need a lot of these things that are there, but in the beginning, we had nothing for a lot of our special patients. So, you know, we're talking, we're talking about how does a patient relative understand what's going on with them and so one of the other things we made over the years were various types of simulators. Now, the one I have here, this one might be for macular degeneration, but this doesn't look like anything. And what this was, Dr. Fay came to me one day in the 1970s and said, no clinician wants to see this patient. We don't know how it's transmitted. And so this was for AIDS patients to simulate, and so we were the first people to see patients with AIDS. I have to say that was a milestone because nobody else was seeing those patients. And uh, so getting back to a student body that I had at SUNY, um, we had this wonderful relationship where the SUNY students would come and be with me for a whole session. Uh, we would have different classes come through and I do have to say that our clinical staff that we have here, Dr. Zimmerman, Spares, and Weinstein were my students. <laughs> and, and a lot of uh, ophthalmologists in the city were our students that were coming through. They were, they were sitting with us during a session and uh, we had seven residencies from Langone, Weill Cornell, Mount Sinai, New York Pioneer, Manhattan Pioneer, Columbia, and Montefiore. And so we've trained a lot of people, um, including this past year, the uh, president of my academy was one of our residents, and he's out in the Chicago area, um, and he's at one of the hospitals, uh, he's a professor. And so we've trained people all over the country. In the, and then we started to train people all over the world. This year we had two people from Mexico, and it was from a clinic that I helped start in Mexico City. Dominican Republic, India, Cairo of all places, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, we went all over. And I know the number is thousands and thousands of people that we helped get a start with. But there's one area I think nobody really knows that we helped get started, another area. And that was with the occupational therapists. Occupational therapy was becoming part of our field. And so once again, we started a program and I was involved with a couple of other people and we went off for 
a weekend. We started in Walnut Creek, California, Northern California. We had a group of people. The next day we were lecturing in Long Beach, California. Two weeks later, we were back on the road. We did Phoenix, Arizona. And by the way, I should mention that it wasn't just occupational therapism. We made sure that an ophthalmologist and optometrist were part of this group. We did not want anybody to be not part of the group. And so that, that second one we were at Phoenix, and then the next day we were in Denver, Colorado. And then two weeks later, we were back on the road for our last occupational therapy trip, and we were in Baltimore, and then we were in Philadelphia. And we went for dinner, and somebody came over, the maitre d' came over and he said, do you mind, some people would like to get his autograph. And somebody said, who? Well, isn't he the coach of the Philadelphia team? <laughs> and they thought I was the coach of the Philadelphia basketball team. So when we start to look Larry at- Larry Brown. <laughs> Larry Brown. Larry Brown, that's correct. Yeah. There's somebody who knows who, who I am. And you know, we, we really have had a, a good time training people all over the world. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's taking care of patients over. We, we had something that nobody else was doing in the beginning, which was incorporating everything. We had, we had our doctors, we had our specialty people, and then we added technology. And, and before we close, I just want to mention, where does technology come from? A friend of mine, was born in Boston and they instilled the wrong drops in his eyes. And he was totally blind in the right eye and 3% in the left eye. And he goes to Harvard and he gets a degree in higher mathematics and he goes out to California and he works for the Rand Corporation. And he said, I can't see any of these specifications. But if we take a television, interface it with a telephoto lens and project it on that screen, somebody's going to be able to see. This is 1968. And he writes a monograph about it, and then he gives away the patent. But meanwhile, he's up in Silicon Valley. And by the middle 70s, these devices, the three companies are already producing these devices. And in fact, if you ride through a tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, if you look up one company says PELCO, that's a closed circuit television, but they were one of the three companies I remember that made these devices. And over the years, Dr. Janensky, Sam Janensky, uh, by the way, he gave, not only gave away the patent, but he left Rand and he started the Santa Monica Center for the Partially Sighted. So he was a wonderful pioneer. And he would come and I remember in the late 70s, he had this great idea. He starts showing these slides, we all had slides, of kids in classrooms. And each one has this closed circuit TV sitting on the desk. And I, again, I don't think people realize that nowadays you can go to our technology and get something this big that will take a picture over there and put it back on the screen that you're sitting in front of. So we've come full circle. And I have to say that the opportunity I, I had to do all these things. And one other thing, I, I came up with this idea. I was um, in the Academy of Op Optometry and I said, why don't we get a what's new session? And I said that to Dr. Fay, and she said, you'll run the session in the Academy of Ophthalmology. And it was in the early 80s. And I'll always remember, we might have been introducing some things like this. And I said, you know, we've reached the pinnacle of technology. <laughs> And, but we have been the pioneers and I feel very proud that we've done this for um, everybody and patients, clinicians, and um, I've been privileged to be here and do that. So there, are, so you've talked about three ways in which we help patients. One, by direct care of patients. Two, by educating other providers and teaching, lecturing, which you do. And third, in the development of glasses, aids, technology, diagnostics that can uh, also improve the field. 100% correct. But I think the last one, 
we have something that very few people think about doing is who is this helping? How is it helping them? That we have the wherewithal to say, this is great for these type of patients. And we can continue to do something on who is it helping more than other people? And why is it helping them? Um, and I, th I think nobody else has an opportunity because it comes down to our patient population, which I think is an incredibly varied population because we have the backing now of a lot of hospitals in the city. And I have to say that's one of the things that you've helped bring together is getting a lot of patients referred from these uh, ophthalmology departments. And we're seeing very rare things. As I mentioned yesterday, three in the world, we're seeing that patient. So you, uh, you started at, at Lighthouse, then came the merger, 2013. Briefly, you were over at the Jewish Guild Food Line and then came here to oh. this building. Yes, I did. Talk mm -hmm. about that transition, because change is sometimes hard. Change was very difficult for me, because I, I was very involved with running around the world. And uh, I have to say that I, I became a, a full-time clinician. In my entire career, I had never been a full-time clinician. I mean, at SUNY, I had a lot of responsibilities I was doing when I was setting up lectures and um, being very involved in my academy and being chair of two different organizations. And then I started a third different organization, helped start the AMD Alliance International. And that was a very big deal for me. Um, and I got involved with, with writing, if I may talk about that for a minute, because I didn't broach that particular subject, which, which I would like to. I think one of the, one of the ways that I, one of the ways that I became very involved with, with writing, which was not part of my background, is that Dr. Fay came out with, this is her second book, and she came out with the term low vision. It was a book by Dr. Fonda, and by the way, I'm gonna go back to Dr. Fonda. Dr. Fonda came to me one day, and everybody knows this, he developed macular degeneration. And he said, could you fit me up with a telescope? And Dr. Fonda had come out and said, I did low vision. I, I came up with that. The same time that Dr. Fay came out with her book, Dr. Fonda came out with a book that says subnormal vision. Dr. Fay's book is low vision. But I felt very proud of this book, and I did write a chapter in here. It happened to be on telescopes again. But But there were a few other books that I became involved in, and how do you, how do you teach clinicians? And I, I, this, this was the second group of, of books that I was involved in, but I came up with chapters that I felt I would learn from. My friends would be writing those kind of chapters. So this is a book, Functional Low Vision, and what you can see is the chart, which didn't come in colors, but this is right on the cover. My name's here, Dr. Cole's name is here. Well, Dr. Cole was somebody that I, I personally, when he came from California, I, I said, we have to hire him for SUNY because this is the op optics expert in the world and he's gonna write the optics chapters for me. Dr. Cole became part of the um, Jewish Guild for the Blind. When I left, he left SUNY and came here. So this is one book and this is a book by Roy, uh, Cole, Remediation and Management of Low Vision. So these, these are a few books that I was very proud of. Later on, um, when I was uh, chairing um, the International Organization on Macular Degeneration, I wrote a book. Macular Degeneration was not being treated at that time. Uh, the first company was, was coming, um, Novartis was going to have a treatment for this in 1970, 1972. Well, those treatments um, were, were not used well until 2009 when they got the first FDA approved treatment. And as of the middle of April, for the first time we have a treatment for the dry or atrophic type of macular degeneration. So that was one thing I liked. And one of the things that we, we modified over the years, which is our handbook. And the handbook was, we started to write this in, in the 80s and modified it. And this is the handbook that was made for clinicians. And there's one, especially for ophthalmology. There's one 
that was in Spanish, which went off to Mexico this past week, <laughs> last week. One other, one other book I do want to mention. Uh, this is volume, this is volume one or two. <laughs> uh, this is a two volume edition, volume one. Uh, in 1999, we held the big, biggest conference on low vision. We expected 1,200 people uh, to show up. We started, um, we came back from a meeting in Madrid, and at that particular meeting, uh, we introduced contrast at the international meeting, myself and Eris Arditi, and then we started to make preparations for 1999, and we ended up having, not 1,200 people, we ended up having the Waldorf story being very upset. They wanted back a lot of our rooms because prices had done this. We filled it up and we had 1,900 people show up for that meeting. And this is Vision Impairment and Vision Rehabilitation, the Lighthouse Handbook. And, and I felt very proud because we had everything that you could think of. Dr. Alan Morse has a chapter in here as well. So when I came to the Lighthouse Guild and we merged, um, we were doing a lot of special things and we had a lot of people who would be floating by and, and a lot of special people would be floating by because we had a theater uh, at the lighthouse. And I, I do wanna interrupt and tell one interesting story about that theater. One day a patient came in and um, we had a nice talk and he said, I'm head of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. I'm the person that when I get on stage, everybody knows at that break, you go to the toilet. <laughs> and so at the end of it, his telling me everything, he had been very philanthropic um, and he was a wonderful person to speak to. He said, you're coming downstairs with me. I said, no, I have patience. I'm not coming downstairs with you. He said, you're coming downstairs to see this film. You're the only place uh, in New York City that has the projection to do this particular film. So I went downstairs and they turned on the film and all of a sudden I didn't know what this was but there were things floating around and it was the first time Avatar was shown in New York City. That was only, they were turned off right away because they wanted to see how the projection would work. Well, a couple of months later we had a scientific meeting and one of the people from Dr. Cal's hospital, Wild Cornell, comes up there and it's Cecil Arkish, <laughs> and he's a retinal specialist. And he somehow is doing something like Avatar up there. So it was wonderful. When I came, when we merged, um, all that stopped abruptly for me. Well, I happened to love the vision. I wanted to make sure that we were still seeing patients the way we were. And I made a decision that I will be a full-time clinician which again was not in my blood, <laughs> to meet patients every single day. And, and I think what has happened, and especially when you showed up, I think our clinic um, was very healthy. I think patients were starting to understand that there's something more than the east side of Manhattan is the west side of Manhattan, <laughs> which by the way, patients had a very difficult time um, understanding. But I, but I think at this point, uh, we are booking ahead now, and uh, as I said to you, Dr. Cal, I will be available, and if we ever need things, I will, I will be there. So I want you to know that. Okay. So let's look forward. Tell me, tell me about your life going forward. Well, one of my, <laughs> one of my friends happens to be the editor of one of the the journal sets ophthalmology and optometry. I have to say, we were talking last week and he said, you seem to know everything about what went on in, in this profession. And he said, why don't you write a book on it and I'll be the editor. And uh, I have been writing commentaries and that, that's part of their journal. I, I do not want to leave everything, but, but um, you know, I mentioned I have one of my three children lives in Singapore, and um, to see your child on tw only twice a year is not the easiest thing, and so it'll give us a little more time to do that. And I love golf, and I live in New Jersey, and I haven't played golf in New Jersey in over 10 years. On the other hand, I'm not going to abandon what we're doing, 
and, and if there's something that comes up here, I would love to be part of it. Uh, and I, I think you can't abandon something like this but because it's in my blood. It actually is in my blood. And um, again, I've been very, very blessed, I have to use that word, that I've been, oh, when a door opened, I ran through that door. If you don't run through that door, the door closes right away, and I, I found that out. And um, I've been very, 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 again, very happy with what, what I've done, and I want to do it again on some level in the future. Mr. Bruce, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.